This video is sponsored by World Anvil. In the early days of my D&D career, I really struggled with figuring out how to track initiative in a way that all of my players could follow along with. One approach we used for a while, which almost worked, was this whiteboard. Everyone would roll initiative and then we would pass this whiteboard around and write the numbers down. And then we would set the whiteboard to the side somewhere where we could all see it, like propped up on the TV stand or resting on the windowsill. Of course, if you're familiar with the reasons I dislike Matt Mercer's approach to collecting initiative, you could probably see why this was a frustrating process. I would hand the whiteboard to Jay, he'd write that he got a 12, then he'd pass it to Sandra and she'd write that she got a 16. But would she leave enough room for Andrew and Nick if they got like a 14 and a 13? Okay, if she leaves a lot of space, then she has to write her number all the way at the top, and what if Andrew and Nick got like an 18 and a 20 and there's not enough room for them? Like, if you are going to have the players track initiative on their side, you're better off using Matt Mercer's initiative technique of calling for the number ranges 25 to 20, 20 to 15, 15 to 10, etc. But since I have issues with that approach, I knew there still had to be a better solution out there. For actually recording initiative, I have a sheet I use. I've discussed that the last time we talked about this topic. You can find the uh, link for that. Uh, you can download the sheet in the uh, description below for free. But what about a way to display the initiative results for my players so they can follow along with the turn order? Well, around 2017 or 2018, I started playing in a Curse of Strahd campaign, and our GM would use initiative tents, pieces of paper with our names on them to track initiative. And then when a bad guy's turn came around, the GM would add another piece of paper and now we could track their turns as well. And I realized that was basically the answer I'd been looking for for years. So today we're going to talk about initiative tents and how they work, and I'm going to show you how I plan to use them for my upcoming Fandelver campaign when I finally get the chance to run an in-person campaign for the first time in several years. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe and ring the bell. YouTube tracks success by having people watch a video when it's first uploaded, so if you ring the bell to get notified whenever I drop a new video and then you watch that video right away, that actually helps my channel a whole lot. And be sure to come back here tomorrow, Friday, March 8th at 5 p.m. Pacific time for a YouTube live stream to celebrate reaching 40,000 subscribers. We're actually at like 42,000 now. Y'all are completely awesome in more ways than I can say. And it's going to be a lot of fun to hang out together on YouTube tomorrow. So come stop by for a good time. It'll be awesome. Now, before we discuss how to present a record of the initiative scores for our players, we should establish why you might want to do this at all because this is not part of everyone's style and that's okay. From where I stand, there are two main reasons you let the players know whose turns are coming up next, strategy and saving time at the table. Let's start with the latter, saving time at the table. Player turns tend to go faster if they know they're about to go next. It gives them a chance to finalize their plans and be fully prepared when their turn actually arrives. I think a lot of us have had the experience of getting to a player's turn and then just sitting and waiting as they just now figure out what they want to do. Now, sure, sometimes the battlefield changes in a pretty profound way just before their turn and they need to abandon their plans and pivot, and I think we can usually be pretty gracious with each other when that happens. But you can also usually tell when a player truly has not given any thought to what they're going to want to do until their turn actually starts. But even so, a player doesn't necessarily have to be not paying attention to benefit from knowing when their turn is coming up. Heck, we were using this whiteboard for our fourth edition games because even if you were paying attention during everyone else's turns and you were fully invested in what was happening in the battle, it still usually took a while for people to figure out what they wanted to do because they just had so many options in that system. It was practically a necessity to tell people, hey, your turn is coming up soon, you should start reviewing your powers to prepare. Now, whether or not I have a way to show the initiative results to the players, I still often tell the players who's up next. I'll say, okay, Quatra, it's your turn. Phineas, you're on deck. So that way Phineas's player knows to start thinking about what he wants to do and he's ready once Quatra's turn is over. So that's one benefit of displaying initiative. You don't have to keep doing that every turn. Of course, there is a difference between having something available for someone to read when they choose to look that way and waving and getting a player's attention and saying, hey, you're up next. So sometimes I still do both. But that raises a question. If you're gonna tell players who is on deck, at least some of the time, then why bother displaying initiative? And that brings us to the other major benefit for having your initiative on display, strategy. Sometimes when a player is trying to decide what to do with their turn, they might ask, well, who's up next after me? Or who else takes their turn before the monster? I found this is especially common for bards who want to hand out bardic inspiration, or for healers who are trying to figure out who they have to heal before the bad guy takes their next turn. So if you have the initiative results on display in some form, the players can answer their own questions. So by sharing the initiative with them, you're opening the door for the players to better strategize and coordinate with each other. Now you might say, well, 
Sure, the players can see the initiative, but how would their characters know who is going to act next? Isn't that metagaming? And I've made videos about both metagaming and initiative. Links are in the description because these are worthwhile discussions to have. I'd recommend that you go watch both of those videos because they are designed not to tell you how to play, but to help you decide how you want to play, to help you figure out your style. And depending on how you feel about the subjects of metagaming and initiative, yeah, there might be some reasons that you might not want to share the initiative results with your players, but I've honestly never had a problem with that. I would much prefer my players know exactly when the monster is going to act next turn, something they could have already figured out if they just decided to write down whose turn the monster goes between in the first round, especially if the alternative preserving that arbitrary level of mystery means that they might not be ready when it comes to their turn. But that's the trade-off, and your mileage may vary. One of the challenges we're always wrestling with as game masters is how much information to give our players. Do we show them the initiative list? or keep it secret? How much do we share about the inner thoughts of NPCs? How much lore should we present to our players? It's something that we constantly have to navigate. But figuring out how much to present to your players is easier than ever, thanks to today's sponsor, World Anvil. See, here's something we don't talk about all that often, but it feels better to share things with players when it's really clear that we had always planned to share it with them. It's one thing to say, Oh yeah, it's funny you mentioned siblings because the prince you're talking to has always been looking for his lost sister. He doesn't tell you that, but I'm telling you that as the GM. But it's another thing entirely to send your players a professional looking article full of lore where there is a whole dedicated passage about the many expeditions the prince has sent after his missing sibling. In the first example, the players might feel like they're cheating, like they're seeing behind the curtain and they're not supposed to do that. In the other example, you're making the presentation part of the reveal, so it all feels like a cohesive experience that you had always intended from the beginning even if you actually hadn't. And that's the fantastic thing about World Anvil. With very little effort, you can create incredible wikis for your worlds and make sure your players have all the information they need. And World Anvil is making it easier than ever to get started on building your own incredible world with an exclusive discount. If you visit worldanvil.com slash supergeekmike and use the promo code supergeek at checkout, you could save 51% off of any annual membership. Once again, that is worldanvil.com slash supergeekmike and use the promo code supergeek. Thank you so much to World Anvil for sponsoring this video. Okay, so now that we've hopefully gotten on the same page about why you might want to share the initiative results so your players could see them, let's talk about how we actually do that. Now, if you're playing online, this is less of an issue. Most virtual tabletops just have an initiative tracker that everybody can see. I think enemies tend to remain hidden on the initiative trackers by default, but I'm sure you could adjust that setting based on your own preferences. However, I'm preparing to start running in-person games again for the first time in ages, so I'm going to talk about physical initiative tents. I was introduced to initiative tents through a game master and the early versions that he used were incredibly simple. The GM just cut a single piece of paper into seven or eight really thin pieces and handed them out to us before the game. We all folded the paper in half and on the one side, we wrote our character name. That side would face out to the party so we could all see it. On the other side, we wrote our character's name again and then some other basic information. I'm pretty sure we had like our armor class, our spell save DC, our passive perception and like maybe our race and class or maybe our alignment, but it was a pretty stripped down system. So it may have just been those three numbers. I don't actually remember. Then we handed those back to the GM and he hung them on his GM screen and it worked. It was extremely simple and straightforward and it was also basically free. Around that same time, I watched a few episodes of the live streamed actual play show, Acquisitions Incorporated, The C Team. And the GM, Jerry Holkins, had cards for each of the characters, little tents on his GM screen. They looked blank to us, although something could have been written on them and they were just washed out by the camera. That was very possible. But a few episodes later, the tents got a little upgrade. The sides facing the audience didn't look blank anymore. Now they had little images on them representing the characters. Now, that was a highly produced actual play show, so they had official artwork of their characters, and not everybody does. Although, you could. You can always commission an artist to make character art for your party. It's always a treat for your players when you do that. And also, you don't have to be the GM to do that. A player in one of my campaigns commissioned art of the entire party once, and it was dope. But also, you don't need official art. When I played in another campaign run by that same GM who had first used initiative tents for me, uh, he had leveled up his process. Now he asked for a piece of art from everybody in advance of the first game. We usually just went online on Pinterest or wherever and found something that we liked, something that was close enough to how we pictured our characters looking because it didn't really have to be exact. Then when we sat down to play, he had these really cool specialized initiative tents printed from some online template with the art we chose printed onto the side facing us. We just filled in the blanks on the back of our tent with our AC, our spell save DC, and whatever else was on the card. Now that GM still used simple skinny strips of blank paper to represent the monsters because presumably he did not want to waste the energy or ink on making initiative tents for every monster we might face. He also ran really, 
really complex battles with lots of different enemies, so maybe he just didn't want to try to fit all those monsters onto his GM screen with cards that were all the same width as ours. That would also make a lot of sense. But also, if you just use a blank tent, then you could reuse it in the next battle, which helps cut down on the number of pieces of paper you need to keep track of behind your GM screen. Now, here's a helpful tip. Aside from maybe the character name, I would not recommend you type out any of the info that appears on the back of an initiative tent. Everything else can and will change a lot throughout gameplay, and it's a lot easier to have folks write in some numbers and erase them rather than printing off new initiative tents every time somebody levels up. Around the same time our GM started using cool looking initiative tents, I also printed off initiative tents for my own groups. I tried cutting index cards in half longwise, but they were still just too small, so they would just fall right off the GM screen. So I eventually went with something wider and longer. Uh -oh, phrasing. I'll talk about some of the pros and cons for the ones I use when we get to the later part of this video, but I want to talk about how I use initiative tents in my games. Or at least how I used to use them and how I plan to use them going forward. I'm going to try to demonstrate with a visual aid. Hopefully this works. Here we go! First of all, there are a few ways to use initiative tents to indicate who is currently taking their turn. That way if someone zones out or looks at their notes or runs to the bathroom or just loses track of everything that's going on, then when their focus returns to the game, they can just look at the screen and see whose turn it is. And also, if you're playing a game like 5e, sometimes it's incredibly easy to forget whose turn it actually is. Sometimes a player can do something really impressive as a reaction, and then you forget, oh wait, that wasn't actually that character's turn. The only reason you got to do all of that badass stuff and kill that war priest is because you had a reaction when they attacked you. So there are a few options for a visual signifier that can help keep track of who is actually taking their turn right now. First of all, you could conceivably move each initiative tent on each turn. For example, at the top of the round, one character takes their turn, and then when their turn is over, you move their initiative tent from one end of the GM screen to the other, and you slide everybody up toward that higher end of the screen to represent the initiative system moving forward. The potential issue with this is that these tents might not slide super well across the GM screen. Like, I don't really know how easily they'll go around the corners. Plus, that just gets a little bit tedious. Another approach I've seen is that the GM will take a clothespin and clip it onto the top of the initiative tent of the active character. I like this approach, although for reasons I'll explain in a minute, I don't think that that would work for my games. But what I think I'll try instead is putting the clothespin in front of the tent for the character whose turn it is. That way it's not clipping onto the tent itself, but it can still be used to demonstrate at a glance whose turn it is. But why don't I want to clip a clothespin onto the tent itself? Well, because a long time ago, I made a bunch of stickers that represent different conditions. These are literally just the little post-it notes you use to tell people where to sign contracts or other paperwork. In my experience, you can reuse these stickers a few times pretty easily, so I just took a whole bunch of them and I laid them out on a piece of paper. Actually, these are kind of heavy. Are these cardstock or they just feel like it's because they've got so many stickers on them. I don't actually know. And then I labeled them all. These are the ones for characters who have a concentration spell. Uh, these are the ones for characters who are grappled. Basically, you know how some GMs have little rings they drop onto a miniature to represent the effects on that character? Well, I wanted something like that, but I wanted it where I'm more likely to look to see what's going on with that character in my direct eyeline on their initiative tent. Now, I've barely ever used these, not for any reason. I just found that I forgot about them when I was in initiative. And then we went into lockdown and I haven't played in person in four years but I really want to use these more going forward. Now, full disclosure, originally I was going to create my own initiative tents and put a link to my tents in the description, maybe drive traffic to my Patreon, that sort of thing. I actually made my own a few years back. I've since lost that file, but I vaguely remember what was on them, and I figured, well, maybe that template could still be useful to other people too. But I opened up some initiative tents that I bought ages ago on the DMs Guild just so I could use those as a reference for my own new initiative tents to help figure out the ideal spacing, that sort of thing. If I could look at the ones that I'd used before and enjoyed, I could see how wide I wanted mine to be. Phrasing. Obviously. But then I realized, actually these tents are great as is. Now one of the reasons I made my own a few years back was because I used to add passive investigation and passive insight to the tents, neither of which are on the initiative tents we're going to talk about today. But as I reviewed these tents and considered making my own to add those categories, I realized I don't really use either of those passive scores anymore. At all. My game style has changed over the past few years. These days, if somebody doesn't tell me that their character is suspicious, then I'm not going to volunteer the fact that a character is lying based on their passive insight. I'll either make the lie obvious through role-playing, or I'll just wait for the player to choose to tell me that they're suspicious, and then I'll call for an insight check. Likewise, I don't tend to use passive investigation anymore. If somebody tells me that they're looking in a specific location, and I already know that that's the right spot to check, I might just tell them that they find the thing. Or, if I ask them for an investigation check and they fail, then they don't completely fail to see the thing, because the player has already correctly guessed the right place to look. Instead, a low roll might just mean that it takes extra time to search there, or there's some other consequence or complication. And truth be told, if a player said, 
Hey, it says passive insight on my D&D Beyond page, so even though I rolled a three, doesn't this mean I can't get less than a 12? Then I would probably just say, oh yeah, you're right. And I would just write their passive insight score on the bottom of their initiative tent. But I'd probably only do it for that one player. Because in my experience, not every player cares about passive scores. But the ones who do, the ones who bring them up a lot, they tend to really care about them. Because they don't like it when their character fails at things that they think they should be good at, they should be able to just automatically succeed at, especially when the mechanics of the game system seem to back them up. This is maybe a topic for another day, but there are some players who fear failure more than others do. These players might tend to favor certain mechanics that reduce the risk of uncertainty. Things like passive perception, passive insight, and passive investigation. And there's nothing wrong with that. Some people just have a different mental relationship with the concept of failure, especially in a game like D&D where you can't save and reload if you die. Everything you do has a consequence in tabletop RPGs. The story is always moving forward. And that's okay. Like I said, I would probably just make an adjustment to better facilitate that fun of that specific player and only worry about it then. In the meantime, the initiative tents I bought a few years ago on the DMs Guild are gonna work fine. Okay, enough preamble. I think it's time to show you my favorite initiative tents. These were published by somebody named Web Pickers Guild. They're listed as the ultimate character and monster tent collection on the DMs Guild. And they certainly are just that. Now, the first time I used these, I think I missed some of the awesome features that come in the PDF. Maybe these files have been updated since I last used them, or maybe I didn't notice these customization options and just ran them through Photoshop to try to get the same effect that they actually just offer through the documents, PDF functions, options, and settings. You know, who's to say? Who's to say if it's my own obliviousness that meant I did extra work? Yeah, that's probably what happened. Now, this isn't sponsored or anything. I just really want to give this product a shout out because I'm about to get a ton of use out of it. First, we have the standard player character tent. On one side, you've got the character name, level, race, alignment, class, background slash faction, passive perception, initiative bonus, AC, spell save DC, and player name. On the other side, the player name, level, and a space for artwork. Except now it's got some default images for each class, or you could just leave it blank, or you could upload your own image. You can also toggle off the watermark in the background on the GM side of the tent, and there's an option to make these black and white as well to make it easier on your home printing situation. Then we've got monster tents, very simple, just art and name on one side and art, name, and AC on the GM side. But again, you can upload files here. So the players could see a piece of art, but on your side, you could include a screenshot of a stat block or just a cool piece of art or a page number to reference or a QR code for the monster stat block on D&D Beyond. Whatever you want could go here. I've never put monster stats on the back of an initiative tent. I have no idea how helpful that would or would not be. Or if I need a stripped down version that's easier to read while I've got the full stat block in my notes, I don't know yet. But this is the kind of thing that I would be excited to experiment with to see what I prefer when I'm actually playing. Regardless, for the rest of this video, I'm going to make references to putting monster stats on the back of monster tents, but you can put whatever you want back there. This is just the option that occurs to me. Then we've got a version of the character tent with stats on it as well. I might give this one a try just to see how I like having the stats in front of me. Then we get a monster tent template with a lot of details. The front is still image and name, but you can select a few existing images like a goblin or an ooze or a dragon. On the back, you can add hit points and stats, and there's still a window just for attacks or features you want to remember. Then we get some monster and player cards, and these are probably more useful if you want something to hold in your hands, less applicable to what we're talking about today, and not really something that I'm looking for right now. Then we get some wide monster templates, roughly the size of two player character tents side by side. The first of these monster tents has spaces for stats, HP, speed, AC, and two boxes in case you want to put different info in each box. Maybe one of them could have actions, but the other could have features? I don't know, it's up to you. The second is just blank, so if you just want to drop in a screenshot of a stat block or whatever, you could do that here. I like the double-sized tent, it helps to evoke the gravitas of the monster, visually representing the importance it has to the narrative, and if it is actually a large creature, then it helps the players feel small, just seeing this taking up so much space in initiative. I don't honestly know how much I'll use these wide templates, but for my Lost Mine of Fandelver game, I'd be down to try this for the green dragon the party faces off against. That feels like it would be the perfect fight to try it out, because this could just be a fun gimmick for really big monsters, or a really helpful tool for major boss fights. It will depend how I feel once it's at my table. Then we get two versions of a huge monster tent, one that takes up almost an entire paper. Again, the first version has a section for stats, AC, hit points, speed, and two blank windows, one of which is labeled actions. So this really is for the monster that has a whole bunch of powers. The other tent, once again, is basically blank, but you can upload whatever you want. Now in my head, okay, I'm comparing this to the last monster tent we talked about, one that's about half the size of this tent, but still twice as big as a player initiative tent. If that's one that I would use for a young dragon or even a mid-range boss, then this tent could be perfect for your huge enemies, like the Tarask or Thordak from Vox Machina. 
but I feel like this would only work if it was a huge boss like that. Not just physically huge, but also someone the entire story arc or campaign had been building toward. You know, this is for Tiamat at the end of Rise of Tiamat, or one of the Demon Lords at the end of Out of the Abyss. But I also have a hard time visualizing using this for a human-sized enemy. Even someone incredibly powerful, like a Sararak or Vecna, should probably have a human-sized tent, or even just a slightly bigger than average tent. At least, that's how I visualize it. And finally, we get these tents that are much shorter than the others. Now, I have used these before, and from personal experience, they just do not stay on top of the GM screen. They fall off way too easily. But if you're not using a GM screen, then I bet you these would probably work just fine. You could just have a little campsite of tents lined up on the table in front of you. Oh, and also, there's versions of all these tents that are written in French, because this is an awesome product. Anyway, yeah, this literally does all the things I was looking for from my initiative tents, except for two things that I'm probably not going to use anymore. Maybe there are flashier ones out there where you could do a lot of other cool stuff with the background, and those might be cool, but I kind of don't need those right now. These will at least be perfect for my Lost Mine of Fandelver campaign. I can either print them out in black and white at home, or I can go buy some ink from my printer and print them out in color, or I can send them to Staples and print them in color there. I can also print them onto cardstock if I want something a little bit heavier, which I might try this time around. I might still prefer them on a piece of normal paper, but I would be really curious to see how the cardstock feels and if it stays on the GM screen a little bit easier. But either way, this is going to be a really wonderful resource as I get back to playing at the table. But what about you? Do you use Initiative Sense? If not, do you use some other method to let your players know when their turn is coming up next in combat? Let me know in the comments below. If you like this video, you know the drill. Like and subscribe, and please ring the bell. Make sure to come back here tomorrow, Friday, March 8th at 5 p.m. Pacific for a YouTube live stream. Support me on Patreon or become a YouTube member if you're able. We've got some awesome stuff coming soon, I promise. Join my Discord to hang out with the other awesome people and trade ideas. I find that to be an especially helpful resource whenever I make a video about how I solve a specific issue I'm having because I'm just one person. You might not like my solution, but I can basically guarantee that there is somebody in the Discord who has a better idea for what you are looking for for your games. So check it out there. Sign up for my newsletter to stay up to date with my updates, and follow me on Twitch to catch my live streams. All those links are in the doobly-doo below. Click here for a video about how much I love reaction channels and how that secretly ties into my love for D&D. Until next time, play fair, and have fun.